A central bank regulates the nation's money supply and financial institutions in order to provide faith in the banking system and to provide stability in the economy. Before the United States' current central bank, the Federal Reserve, commonly referred to simply as the Fed, there were two other central banks. The First Bank of the United States, which had a 20-year charter from 1791 to 1801, and the Second Bank of the United States, which was chartered from 1816 to 1836. The centralization of power and economic concentration that central banks have was and still is a fear and regularly discussed political issue. During the Second Bank of the United States Charter, Henry Clay, who was a primary advocate of central banks, was determined to make central banks an issue for the election year of 1832. In 1832, Congress passed a rechartering measure for the Second Bank of the United States. However, President Andrew Jackson vetoed the charter, rendering a powerful message that central banks were unconstitutional. There would not be another central bank in the United States for nearly 80 years. The free banking era was from 1837 to 1862. During this time, individual banks issued banknotes and deposit liabilities which served as the nation's money supply. These banknotes were either used for deposits and looked and functioned similar to the way the present day paper currency does. Since these banknotes were from different banks, they carried different default risk and were discounted depending on how risky the market determined the issuing bank to be. The banknotes had a face value and the discount would be applied to the note's face value. If a consumer held currency from a bank that was considered risky, he may have to pay $1.25 for something that only costs a dollar. If it was rumored that a bank was about to fail, notes from that bank might not be accepted by anyone at all. With all the risk involved with bank notes, it isn't a surprise that people during this time preferred hard money, gold and silver, over paper currency. At one time, there were more than 15,000 different banks issuing their own bank notes. As you can imagine, this was very confusing and it became difficult to distinguish the good bank notes from the bad bank notes. Another problem that occurred during this time was that the quantity of money varied greatly in the United States. Banks would issue more loans, meaning that they printed more bank notes during economic booms and would contract their level of lending during recessions. A lot of private banks would fail during recessions, inducing banks to further contract the money supply. Thus, the nation's money supply was not only a varying credit quality, but it was also expanding and contracting, thereby exaggerating the cycles. A series of national banking acts were passed in the mid-1860s in an attempt to improve the soundness of the money and to assist in financing the Civil War by allowing the sale of U.S. government bonds. Remember, as we said before, at one time there were more than 15,000 different currencies in circulation. To force the multitudes of different banknotes out of circulation and move to a sound money supply, the national banking acts applied a 10% annual tax on all banknotes that were issued by state chartered banks. This act made it expensive to issue bank notes and made it difficult for state banks to compete with national banks. However, banks were allowed to be chartered as national banks and issue bank notes tax-free if they agreed to be regulated by the Comptroller of Currency. Among the conditions required to issue bank notes were 1. Banks were required to have their bank notes printed by the U.S. Mint to reduce the risk of counterfeiting and 2. Banks were required to back their banknotes with holdings of U.S. government bonds that slightly exceeded the value of the banknotes. This was supposed to provide faith in nationally chartered banks because if the bank failed, the issued banknotes could still be redeemed at face value. State banks were allowed to operate, but the number of state banks was expected to dwindle considerably due to the 10% annual tax imposed on the issuance of banknotes. Although it was expensive for state banks to issue banknotes, they were still allowed to issue demand deposit liabilities, checking accounts, instead of bank notes. Checking accounts quickly became popular, and the number of state banks did not dwindle as much as expected. However, notes issued by state and local banks were essentially pushed out of circulation due to the 10% tax. The checking accounts were still not insured, and there was still risk of failure, so the demand deposits were often discounted when used for financial transactions. Banks were still at risk of failure if they issued more demand deposits and loans than what they held in reserves. One of the problems with the National Banking Acts was that they allowed banks to count their deposits in other banks as part of their reserves, pyramiding reserves. This meant that banks could run out of reserves simultaneously. One bank would run short in reserves to meet withdrawals, 
In order to meet the demand, the bank would withdraw its reserves deposited in another bank, thereby causing that bank to run short on reserves. Because the National Banking Acts required the banknotes issued to be backed by U.S. government bonds, the banks could not simply issue more banknotes, causing the banks to run short on cash and cause what is known as a bank panic or bank run. The patterns preceding financial panics were all very similar. The economy would first enter a period of rapid expansion creating high demand for bank credit. Banks would then issue more and more notes to meet the demand for credit, thereby increasing the money supply which would further stimulate the economy causing inflation and higher interest rates. Some banks overextended themselves by issuing too many bank notes compared to the amount of reserves they held. As the economy would begin to slow down, the overextended banks would not be able to meet their demands causing people to panic. As the word of the overextended banks failing spread, people would all run to their banks demanding to have their paper currency converted into hard currency, gold and silver coins. When this happened, the banks would be forced to call in loans from their customers who were not expecting the call. At this time in history, most bank loans were call loans, meaning that they did not have maturity and repayment is required when banks make the call. When banks called in their loans, it would cause many businesses to fail because they were not expecting the call. The panic was perpetuated through word of mouth only spreading the bank panic further thereby causing a large number of banks to fail. The failure of so many banks would push the economy into a recession. From the 1860s to the early 1900s there were a number of serious recessions and financial panics which finally led to the crash of 1907. The 1907 panic caused widespread bank failures, heavy losses to depositors, and forced the economy into a deep recession. The panic of 1907 convinced the public and the politicians that a central bank was necessary to prevent widespread bank panics which resulted in economic recessions. There is a lot of disagreement on how the central bank should be structured and establishing the Federal Reserve System was most definitely a challenge.